Support for this program comes from listeners like you. To find out more, visit us online at chipbrogdon.com. The Parables of the Lost and Found. This is part seven of All the Parables of Jesus. As we begin to consider a group of parables that have to do with the Lord's attitude or the Lord's heart, his desire, his will, his intention towards those who are lost. So we're going to consider that and uh, follow a basic outline first. We'll talk about the principle of of lost and found. Um, Secondly, we'll talk about the five parables of the lost and found. And then we will draw four lessons from those parables. And then we'll summarize the teaching. So the the principle of lost and found, and and I guess probably the, the basic premise, is that God intends to save and to to seek and to save that which is lost and the purpose of seeking and saving the lost is to restore everything that was lost by Adam now the the fall of Adam goes as we go all the way back and think about the garden of eden the fall of adam uh, was it's important to understand that God knew from the beginning and planned accordingly. It's not as though uh, the fall of Adam took God by surprise. It's not as if God had to come up with a plan B, some kind of a recovery plan, um, because he did not anticipate that Adam would rebel. No, of course not. He knew that giving Adam the freedom to choose, Adam would choose wrongly. He would choose an independent path. And so God made provision from the very beginning to recover what had been lost. And so God's role throughout all of human history is the role of seeking and saving that which is lost. It is the devil who comes to steal, kill, and destroy, Jesus says, but I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. God sent him to be the savior of the world not the destroyer of the world. God sent Jesus to be the Savior, not the destroyer. So that's the basic principle of lost and found, that all of us are lost. All of us are born into a lost condition in the sense that we have lost our way. And so I believe that God is working in each person to bring them back to a place of fellowship and friendship and relationship with him. I believe that he does this for everyone. I believe that he was working in your life long before you accepted him, quote unquote, long before you decided or made a decision for Jesus or decided to follow Jesus. In my email invitation uh, invitation to you, I mentioned how religion tends to emphasize the decision that you make. It emphasizes your right to choose. It emphasizes your need to accept and the possibility of rejecting the Lord Jesus. And so religion inadvertently, I believe, it exalts people to a position of being like God in the sense that they believe that they can choose right or wrong, they believe they believe that they can choose to follow Jesus or they can choose not to follow Jesus, or it, it gets people to assume that if someone is not going to church or someone is not talking about the Lord or someone in their eyes are that, that they are lost or that they are not saved, uh, then it means that they have decided not to follow Jesus. And that's that's not necessarily the case either. Just because they have not made a decision like you have made, they haven't walked the aisle like you walked the aisle, they haven't prayed a prayer the way you prayed a prayer, it doesn't mean that they have rejected the Lord. In most cases, it means they simply haven't seen the Lord. They, they haven't had a revelation of Christ. And uh, 
assuming that you have had that and you have seen the Lord and you have had a revelation of Jesus, uh, it's often in spite of the church, not because of the church, that you are saved. Uh, It's in spite of religion that you, by the grace of God, have been saved. And if your faith is in yourself or your faith is in something that you did or something that you confessed or something that you agreed to or something that you decided, uh, then it's time to revisit how and why in that you were saved to begin with. Because as we'll see in these parables, it is the Lord Jesus who does the seeking and the saving and that we, in fact, cannot seek him at all. Uh, So we want to consider these things, and I think that will help people uh, when they, they misunderstand the purpose of God's plan to save and to heal and to deliver and to redeem, that he desires all people to be saved and to come to the full knowledge of the truth. Uh, I I think that a lot of people make the same mistake that the Jews made, that they believe that God had blessed them because they were superior. God blessed them because they were more righteous. And in Deuteronomy 9, God reminded them, when you go into this promised land, don't, don't get the idea in your head that you're getting all of this all of these blessings and that I'm driving out these other nations because you're more righteous than these other nations. Uh, he said, it's not because of your righteousness. It's because of my grace that, that you have anything at all. And in fact, you are a rebellious and stiff necked generation. So again, it underscores the grace of God uh, is intended to bless the nations, not to curse the majority of them and only save a few. And I think that same attitude has crept into the Christian church over the last 2,000 years, that God is mostly concerned with saving the ones who have uh, made a decision to to follow Jesus, or that God is mainly interested in saving the ones who accept Jesus, and the ones who have not uh, are are in a worse spiritual state and are even deserving of going to hell and being punished. So the parables of lost and found are going to kind of turn that thinking around and and get us to go back to the very basics of what the kingdom of God is all about. And that is that God desires for all people to be saved and to come to the full knowledge of the truth. So that's the principle of lost and found. Let's illustrate it because I think it's easier to illustrate it in a story format than it is to try and and teach it. And that's exactly why I believe that Jesus gave us these parables. The parables of the lost and found help to illustrate something that uh, we should not easily forget, but religion tends to uh, give us amnesia. We tend to forget where we came from. We forget who does the saving. We forget who does the healing. We forget who does the delivering. We forget who does the drawing to the Lord in the first place. And we think that it's because of our great righteousness and our great faith and our great intelligence that we made this big decision to follow Jesus and the rest of the world that were not smart enough to make that decision Uh, they're going to be punished, and we're going to enjoy uh, all the benefits of having made the right decision. And I would just point out to you and and illustrate through these parables that God is the one who decides to save us. He is the one who accepts us. He is the one who chooses us. And in fact, he is the one who seeks and saves us. He seeks us. We don't seek him. He chooses us. We don't choose him. We can't come to him anyway unless we are drawn to him. And so um, let's look at some of these parables. And there's five parables that we'll look at today. Well, the first is the parable of the two debtors. And it's interesting because all of these parables are going to come to us from the Gospel of Luke. So Matthew is giving us most of the kingdom parables, describing the kingdom of God and the prophetic um, unfolding of God's purpose and plan throughout multiple ages. Um, Luke gives us a picture of the Son of Man, and it's in the Gospel of Luke that we see these parables of the lost and found, which makes sense because Luke is not Jewish. Luke is, is Gentile. He is writing outside of Israel, 
And whereas Matthew was writing from the perspective of a Hebrew writing for Hebrews, Luke is writing from a more universal, a more, a more, um, a more expansive worldview. He's trying to introduce Jesus to people who are not Jewish. And uh, so it's interesting because these parables of the lost and found are very appropriate to illustrate uh, the, the principle that God is out to save all. It's not as though uh, God intended to save Israel and destroy the rest of the world, but the whole point in Genesis 12 was to bless you so that through you, all the other nations could be blessed. And so that illustrates, even from the very beginning, that God is not saving a remnant so he can curse the rest, but he is saving the remnant using a few so that he can save the many. And that principle is, is, still, uh, is still true to this very day. Uh, so we look at the parable of the two debtors in uh, Luke chapter 7, and it begins with a, a little bit of context. Luke 7, 36, then one of the Pharisees asked him, asked Jesus to eat with him. And Jesus went to the Pharisee's house and sat down to eat. And behold, a woman in the city who was a sinner, when she knew that Jesus sat at the table in the Pharisee's house, brought an alabaster flask of fragrant oil and stood at his feet behind him weeping. And she began to wash his feet with her tears and wipe them with the hair of her head. And she kissed his feet and anointed them with the fragrant oil. Now, when the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he spoke to himself, saying, This man, if he were a prophet, would know who and what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. And Jesus answered and said to him, Simon, I have something to say to you. So he said, Teacher, say it. And so here comes the parable. Verse 41. There was a certain creditor who had two debtors, one owed 500 denarii and the other 50. And when they had nothing with which to repay, he freely forgave them both. Tell me, therefore, which of them will love him more? Simon answered and said, I suppose the one whom he forgave more. And he said to him, You have rightly judged. Then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet, but she has washed my feet with her tears and wiped them with the hair of her head. You gave me no kiss, but this woman has not ceased to kiss my feet since the time I came in. You did not anoint my head with oil, but this woman has anointed my feet with fragrant oil. Therefore I say to you, her sins which are many are forgiven, for she loved much. But to whom little is forgiven, the same loves little. Then he said to her, your sins are forgiven. And those who sat at the table with him began to say to themselves, Who is this who even forgives sins? Then he said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Okay, so the parable of the two debtors. And here's, here's an example where one owed 500 and the other owed 50. So one owed 10 times as much as the other. Neither one of them could repay, and so he forgave uh, the creditor forgave both of their debt. And so the point of the story is that the one to whom much is forgiven, that one is going to love him more than the one who had just a little that was forgiven. Uh, so let's break this down. First of all, the context of this parable contrasts the attitude of the, of the Pharisee with the attitude of the woman. So here is the Pharisee who has invited Jesus to dinner. And of course, the Pharisee was the, the highest level of religious leadership in, uh, in Judaism. You had the Pharisees and the Sadducees. The Sadducees were more political and more in charge of the temple, but the Pharisees were the fundamentalists. They were the, the preachers or the, or the teachers, the experts in the law. And so this parable is really contrasting uh, the, the religious person with the sinner. Uh, the Pharisee represents religion, and the woman represents relationship. I'm always talking about the difference between religion and relationship as we discuss a Christ-centered faith. Uh, I, I say it's, it's about a relationship with Jesus, not a religion about Jesus. I believe that the religion about Jesus has done more to distract us from a relationship with Jesus than anything out in the world or anything satanic. Uh, it's, it's the harlot church 
that seduces us, leads us astray from the simplicity of Christ, and gets us trapped into a religious, self-righteous world. Um, and, and that self-righteousness is revealed in what the Pharisee said to himself, if this man were a prophet, he would know what manner of woman this is who is touching him, for she is a sinner. So the Pharisee, you, you see, he believed that he was worthy of the presence of Jesus, more worthy than this woman who is a sinner. Um, I'm saying the woman represents relationship, uh, and we see that in how much love she demonstrates there. This is a lost and found parable because it illustrates how those who we think are lost are actually found through forgiveness. And it also illustrates how those who we think are found are lost through hypocrisy. <laughs> so, and you've seen this theme repeated over and over again, that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but the one who does the will of my Father in heaven. And if you love me, Jesus says, you'll keep my commandments. So here we see that it's actually the ones who have sinned the worst that are the best ones to represent the grace and the love of God. It's the ones who believe they have sinned the least, that have little to be forgiven of, that think they are doing God a great big favor by inviting Jesus into their heart, just like this Pharisee thought he was doing Jesus a great big favor by inviting Jesus into his home. And a lot of people, the way they've been taught and the way they've come to the Lord, it's kind of like the way this Pharisee invited Jesus into his house. Uh, there's there's no real love for the Lord. There's no um, There's no awareness of the fact that uh, of, of whose presence you are in uh, and they just kind of take Jesus for granted and so the, the Pharisee invites him into his house uh, the same way we are told we must invite Jesus into our heart and um, basically that's true but it's been distorted and it's it's been turned into such a self-centered uh, religious activity that it really has no more significance now than it did when the Pharisee invited Jesus uh, into his home, but he did not show him the common courtesies. He did not show him the level of respect, the level of worship, and the level of love that this ordinary woman, this ordinary sinner out here demonstrated. Uh, so Jesus did not deny that the woman had many sins, right? <laughs> so he didn't get into an argument with the Pharisee and say, well, she's not as bad as all of that. And he, and he never even he never even uh, uh, argued the fact that she had many sins. He says, I say to you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven, for she loved much. So she's like the one who owed the 500. Now, see, the point is, neither one of them could pay the bill and so the fact that the creditor decided to cancel both debts, it should have made both of them equally uh, happy. But the one who had much to, much more to be forgiven uh, loves much more than the one who had very little to be forgiven. Um, and it, it's interesting. I, I was trying to think of a parallel of this. And if... If you have uh, been to school and if you have financed any portion of your college education and you have student loans, for example, and let's say you have student loans that total $50,000 and then someone else has a student loan that totals $5,000 and then uh, you go and you go into debt and you complete your college education and you get your degree. And then a, a few years after that, the government declares that everyone should have a free college education. And so they're going to give everyone free, uh, free college. And so uh, it will not cost you anything and you do not, you do not have to go into debt. Some states are trying to, to get this over here and that may be the case in your country or it may not be. I don't know. But the point is that when suddenly you are having to pay for something that someone else is getting for free, it leaves you feeling a little bit of resentment. 
and especially if they're not going to go back and cancel all the student loan debt that had already been incurred, but they just give the education for free to anyone who qualifies. Uh, so, so the 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 point is to look at the reaction of people when their debts are forgiven. And if you have a fifty thousand dollar debt and it's forgiven, then you're ecstatic. But if someone else is forgiven, and and they uh, and yours is not, then it it creates uh, resentment. So I'm I'm using that to illustrate the way it is with our sins as well. Um, some people believe that they are not as bad as others, and that somehow it's more difficult for God to forgive their debt, to forgive their sin, than it is to forgive them of of uh, theirs. That other people are greater sinners than them. And this is the attitude that creeps in with religion. I'm trying to convey to you that Jesus did not deny that the woman had many sins. But the point is that her having many sins was not an obstacle to his forgiveness. Instead, it, it really it encouraged greater love. So where sin abounds, it says in Romans, God's grace does much more abound. So when the, the debt is large and it's forgiven, uh, it, it creates a greater um, a greater response of love. There's more thanksgiving taking place. So having many sins is not a barrier. The Pharisee thought, well, Jesus really doesn't know who he's dealing with, but actually Jesus knew better than than anyone else who the woman was and what the woman had done. And he also knew the Pharisee and knew the Pharisee's heart as well. And so in, in this neat parable, he, he really exposes both. And so based on what Jesus said, who is really the lost one here? Think about it. Who's really the one that's lost? Is it the woman who is a sinner, but she repents? Or is it the Pharisee who is righteous, all the while condemning other people in his heart? So that's part of the lesson of the, of the parable of the two debtors. So we go to the second parable, which is the parable of the Good Samaritan. It's also in Luke, in Luke chapter 10, and that is uh, Luke 10, 33. Yeah, actually it should be um, Luke 10, 30. Let's begin reading in Luke 10, 30. Now in the, in the context here, um, one of the teachers of the law, it says that he tested Jesus by asking him, um, what should I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus basically said, keep the commandments, love God and love your neighbor. And the man answered, um, who is my neighbor? And then Jesus told them this story, this parable in um, Luke ten thirty. He says, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these three do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, He who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. So this is a parable of the lost and found, because here is a man who is left for dead, and so I I would consider him lost, and people considered him lost, and this is how we consider the lost too many times. A lost man left for dead. Now since he's coming from Jerusalem, he's coming down from Jerusalem on the way to Jericho, he's probably Jewish. So that 
kind of makes it all the more shocking when you realize that it's a priest and a Levite, a priest uh, and a Levite, both of them part of the Jewish religion, right? They both see him and pass by on the other side, and they do nothing. And this illustrates that religion cannot save you. That's what, it, that's what it's telling you. Religion cannot save you. Here's a man who's been left for dead. The devil came in to steal, kill, and destroy, and that's exactly what, what it did. He fell among thieves, stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Well... That is the picture of of lost mankind. That's what's happened. And what he is illustrating here, Jesus is illustrating, uh, among other things, is that religion cannot save you. So here's a certain priest. He comes, he looks, he passes by the other side. Same thing with the Levite. Sees him and passes by on the other side doing nothing. It, It was a Samaritan, and the Samaritans are hated by the Jews. The Samaritans are not considered... Um, complete Jews but in that period of time and in that part of the world the Samaritans and the Jews did not get along John chapter 4 references that animosity when the woman at the well was surprised that Jesus would speak to her as a Samaritan she says the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans so she was surprised that Jesus would even talk to her uh, not not even as a woman, but also uh, as a Samaritan, that he would speak to her at all. Well, in this case, it's a Samaritan, someone who is hated by the Jews, who had compassion on the Jew, bound his wounds, and took care of him. So in this case, this parable, in this parable, Jesus is the Samaritan. He is the one who is despised and rejected by the Jews, but he has compassion on the man who is lost and saves him, the man who is left for dead, the man that religion cannot touch, the man that religion does not want to have anything to do with. And once again, it shows us that religion cannot save us. Those whom religion deems to be lost, unworthy, dead, and unsavable, Those are the very ones that Jesus intends to love, to save, to heal, to deliver, and redeem. And he does not need religion to accomplish this. Again, we see here the difference between religion and relationship. Religion sees the dead, the half-dead man in the road, the man in need, and passes by on the other side and doesn't do anything. That's religion. But relationship here is illustrated by Jesus, who had compassion, illustrated by the Samaritan, who had compassion on him, took care of him, and provided for his needs. So the point is, religion is, in my opinion, which I think is accurate, religion is very quick, and when I say religion, I mean religious people, are very, very quick to condemn the lost and to project their condemnation upon God. And so they naturally gravitate towards those verses that seem to indicate the damnation of sinners and the condemnation of sinners. And how quickly they forget that all of us have sinned, that all of us have fallen short of the glory of God. And it's not your own righteousness that saved you, but it was the grace of God. And what religion is so is so quick to discard and throw away, the Lord Jesus says they are worthy. The people that religion is willing to send to hell, Jesus says, I died to save them. And I'm not, I've not come to destroy them in my death, but to save them in my death. His purpose of dying, it says in Hebrews, to destroy, that through death he would destroy him who had the power of death, that is the devil. So the purpose of, of the Son of God, it says, being manifest is to destroy the works of the devil, it says in First John. It's not to destroy the victims of the devil. It's not to destroy the ones who have been led astray and deceived by the devil. It's not to destroy the lost, not to destroy the ones that we deem are unsavable. 
the ones that we consider to be beyond hope, the ones that we consider to have rejected the Lord. And in this case here, the Samaritan, he's dead. He's half dead. And that's the other thing to keep in mind here is that Jesus does not need anyone's permission to save them. Because most people are like the half-dead man lying here in the road. They're not in a position to accept it. They're not in a position to reject it. Spiritually speaking, they're half-dead already. They're just lying in the road, and religion can't do a thing in the world to help them. But where religion fails, relationship saves the day. And the relationship I'm talking about is the relationship that we enjoy the relationship that we have with Jesus, but also the relationship that Jesus has with the world. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost, and he is the Savior of the world. He's not the Savior of Jews. He's not the Savior of Christian people. He's not the Savior of really committed disciples. He is the Savior of the world. So it doesn't matter if this man accepts it or rejects it, and it could be that uh, he's not even in his right mind. Maybe he's been hit in the head and he, he doesn't even even know who he is, much less who this Samaritan is that is trying to save his life. And isn't that the case a lot of the time? So Jesus isn't waiting for permission. He is seeking and saving. He sees someone in need and he saves them. He sees someone in need and he heals them. He sees someone in need and he picks them up puts them on his, on his own animal, takes him back to the inn, and takes care of him. So I'm just contrasting that, and I think Jesus is contrasting that with the attitude of the, of the man here who's asking him a religious question, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And then to justify himself, he wants to know, well, who is my neighbor? You know, <laughs> love God and love your neighbor. Well, uh, who is my neighbor? Uh, how do you define neighbor? Is it just the, is it the guy living next door to me, or is it is it really everybody? Are there are there some people that I can get away with not loving by by redefining neighbor? <laughs> so Jesus told him this story to indicate. That the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. And it also illustrates that religion is, a, is an abject failure. It has failed. It is a failure. It's, it fails because it creates self-centered, self-righteous religious fanatics who forget the whole purpose of Jesus seeking and saving the lost and seeking and saving them if, in fact, they are saved. Okay, so then we come to Luke chapter 15, where we consider the last three parables, and all three parables are in this one chapter of Luke chapter 15. So we begin with the parable of the lost sheep, Luke 15, 1. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. See, Luke is very careful to record the the son of man the servant and the the universality of Christ and the gospel because again Luke is on the outside he is a gentile and he is writing for the benefit of gentiles and so you you understand that in in that time of at the time of that writing this idea of, of Jesus being a universal Savior in the sense that Jesus is not just the Savior of the Jews or the King of the Jews, but he's the King of the world and he's the Savior of the world. Uh, this idea was completely um, um, antithetical to the Jewish understanding of things. And the Jewish understanding of things is the basic religious understanding of things, that God favors us and God blesses us and God prospers us because we have this special relationship with him that other people don't have and that other people can't have. So whether that comes through in the Jewish idea of we're living in the promised land and the rest of the world are Gentiles, 
or whether it comes through the Christian idea that we believe in Jesus and go to church and everybody else is going to hell unless they believe the way exactly the way we believe. It's the same religious spirit that comes through. So Luke is very careful to show how Jesus is a friend of sinners and also that Jesus is all about saving the lost. Instead of throwing the lost away, Jesus is out to redeem the lost, to take what was stolen, to take what is lost, to take what has been discarded by religion, and to seek and to save that which is lost. And he gives us three parables here. So the sinners, it says, uh, verse 1 of Luke 15, all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. (laughs) What a great story. What a great parable. Now, bearing in mind that the prophets have long associated mankind with sheep who go astray. And so Christ as being the good shepherd and that great shepherd of the sheep, uh, it's a really wonderful way of illustrating uh, the, the greatness and goodness of the shepherd, as well as the dumbness of the sheep who keep going astray. Sheep are naturally dumb and they are naturally prone to getting into all kinds of trouble, which is exactly why they need a shepherd. Plus, sheep are also very easy prey because they don't have any natural defenses. You know, so they are defenseless and dumb. I mean, that those are the two things that come to mind when you consider uh, the attributes of sheep. And so it's, it's not by accident that David, in in the book of Psalms, a couple of times he compares himself to a sheep that has gone astray and asks the Lord to bring him back uh, as he repents and asks for forgiveness. It's no accident that Isaiah 53 says that all of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Each one of us have turned aside to our own way. And that has been the condition ever since Adam's fall in the garden. This is why sheep need a shepherd. And it's why sheep who go astray are in huge trouble. Well, this is the condition of mankind, and this is why Jesus came. Now, the point of this parable is this. If a shepherd goes to so much trouble to find one lost sheep, would not the good shepherd go to at least that much trouble, if not more trouble, to save a lost soul? See, a shepherd will lay down his life for for a sheep. How much more will the Son of Man, the good shepherd, lay down his life for a lost soul? And he even tells us at the conclusion of this parable what the normal response is to the shepherd finding the lost sheep. It should be an occasion for great rejoicing and celebration. And he's contrasting this with the attitude of the Pharisees and the scribes who's complaining that Jesus is actually receiving sinners and eating with them. In other words, they expected their Messiah. This is one reason why they they were convinced that he is not the Messiah. He wasn't religious enough. He's fellowshipping with sinners and with um, with the lost. And they're complaining about it instead of rejoicing about it. We ought to rejoice. See, we make the same mistakes. We should be rejoicing at the idea that God intends to seek and to save the lost. That that when God tells us, pray for all men, 
because God desires that all men, that all mankind, all people, all persons would be saved and would come to the full knowledge of the truth. And instead of rejoicing at that great love and that great revelation of the greatness and goodness of God, instead of rejoicing at that, people want to argue about that. It's like in order to justify their own sense of salvation, they can't be satisfied unless they know that a good portion of the world is going to go to hell and be punished. They almost have to have that to establish their own identity. And they're actually threatened by the idea that Jesus wants to save them all and that Jesus will save them all. And I, I get labeled all kinds of names for even suggesting this other part of Scripture that is often overlooked that indicates God's will. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he will gather together in one all in Christ. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. He has shut them all up in unbelief that he may have mercy upon them all. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were enemies of the Lord, he reconciled us to himself. And in the end, God will be all in all. I mean, you bring these out and you get labeled as, as something that is, um, that is bad. You get labeled as a heretic. Well, the normal what should be the normal response for anyone who has the love of God and the compassion of Jesus? The normal response should be great rejoicing and celebration that God's purpose and plan actually encompasses more than just a little group of people, but actually uh, he is the Savior of all men, it says, especially those who believe, but not exclusively those who believe. But how soon we forget and how quick we are to take credit for our own salvation and, and minimize the power of God at work in other people's lives. So he even tells us what the normal response should be, which is great rejoicing and celebration whenever the lost are found and brought home, brought back where they belong. That's been the mission from the beginning. It's not to save a few and damn the rest. It's to save the world. And so you see the Pharisees and the scribes complaining about the, the very love and compassion and grace of God that goes out and searches for that, which, for that one that is lost until he finds it. Until he finds it. Well, here's another example. He, he's, he's giving them three parables. He's really wanting to make this point. Luke 15, 8, Or what woman, having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I lost. Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, they have to repent. I'm not suggesting that people can be saved without repenting and without believing in Jesus. I'm saying that the Son of Man, just like the Good Shepherd, searches for that lost sheep until he finds it, and just like this woman, woman searches for the lost coin until she finds it, unlike us, God doesn't give up. Unlike us, love never fails. Love never fails. It may take a long time, and certainly some people are more difficult than others. But is anything too difficult for the Lord? Is his arm short that he cannot save? It says, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And you and me may give up, but he never gives up. So, once again, in this parable, the coin is lost. Now, it's not the fault of the coin that it's lost, because a coin doesn't, 
it can't move. It can't make its own decisions. The coin is lost, not not uh, due to its own dumbness, the way a sheep can get lost and wanders astray. But in this case, the coin is lost because of the carelessness of someone else. A coin doesn't have a mind of its own. And it's just as it's the nature of a sheep to go astray and, and get lost, uh, sometimes it's through no fault of, of its own, the coin finds itself lost, right? But the point is very similar to the story of the sheep. How much more valuable is a lost soul than a lost sheep? How much more valuable is a lost soul than a lost coin? And the point of it is to illustrate if this woman goes to so much trouble to find a lost coin, would not the Savior of the world go to at least that much trouble and probably much more trouble to save a lost soul? So how can you complain about the Lord Jesus receiving sinners and eating with them? It's interesting, too, because we talk a lot about receiving the Lord Jesus. It's According to this, it's not about us receiving Jesus. It's about Jesus receiving us, and Jesus receives sinners all the time. <laughs> well, I'm trying to get you, get you to consider that it's, it's not about your ability to do something, but it's about his ability. And it's not rejoicing in what you have done, but it's coming to terms and coming to grips with what Jesus has already done. It's not what I do, it's what he does. It's not what you do, it's what he is doing. And if that's the case, then it's up to him to seek and to save the lost, to look for that lost sheep until he finds it. Or like the woman, to look for that lost coin until she finds it. And we have the privilege of co-laboring together and, and helping him in the search if we understand that that's the point. But for a lot of people, uh, it it is it becomes a religious exercise of trying to grow the church, witness for Jesus. Uh, it's really uh, inviting people to become a a co laborer in the local church, the the local religious system. Just like the Pharisees, Jesus says, you travel land and sea to make one convert, and then once you do, you turn him into twice the son of hell as yourself. That's the multiplication of religion. But when we really get a sense of the of the heart of the good shepherd, to seek and to save that which is lost, then I think it will be it will be natural for us. And I think that probably the greatest lessons that we see in these parables of the lost and found is is salvation is not a passive gift, but is an active search and rescue operation. I mean, what kind of search and rescue team would it be that sits on the beach all the time or sits in the rescue station and they know people are drowning. They know people are capsizing. They know people are crashing, falling overboard in the waves. They, the storm's out there raging. But they're sitting there waiting for someone to, in, to invite them, to give them an invitation before they go out and try to save them. That's what's so amazing about Jesus, who not just saves the lost, but he is seeking and saving the lost. He is working by his Holy Spirit in the heart of every, of every man, woman, Boy and girl, he's working in spite of religion. He's working in spite of the failure of the institutional church. That's because salvation is not a passive gift. It's not just something that he's... he's it's a gift, but it's not a passive gift. It's not something that he, he's, he puts on display and then says, okay, if you want it, here it is. But if you don't want it and you reject it, then uh, it's that's there's nothing I can do about it. It's all up to you now. Salvation is not a passive gift. Salvation is an active search and rescue operation. 
because once the sheep are lost, they're not going to naturally find their way back home again. It's going to take a shepherd to go out and search for them. That's the point. And Jesus is that shepherd. He doesn't just offer a passive gift and then sit back and wait and see if anybody's going to take it. He is seeking and saving that which is lost. Same thing with the coin. Say, well, I lost a coin. Oh, well, it'll come back. No, the coin isn't going anywhere. And it's not going to be found unless you go out and look for it. So salvation is not a passive gift that God just offers up and he sits back and wait and see if anybody's going to take it or not. And then the ones that do, great. The few that do, great. But then the ones that don't take it or don't know that they, that it's available or for whatever reason they don't take it, well, it's too bad for them. No, Jesus is on an active search and rescue operation to seek and to save that which is lost. And again, The proper response in this situation is rejoicing and celebration. It's not jealousy. It's not anger. It's not envy. But when you find something that has been lost, you rejoice because you've been looking for it. And most of us aren't looking for the lost. We just kind of take the lost for granted because we're found. And I'm saying Jesus does not take anything for granted. He does not take anyone for granted. And the other lessons that we're going to to pull from this is the value of one person, the value of one soul. And that if one soul stays lost, if one soul stays in a condition of being unsaved, then Jesus has not yet fulfilled his mission. He is seeking and saving. If it means that 99 are saved and only one is left, He will still leave the 99 to go look for the one. Now, a lot of people will say, we got all we can get, and that's good enough for us. It should be good enough for God. And so we go to God with a lot of excuses and a lot of reasons why, and a lot of theological explanations as to why all people can't be saved. And all they are is excuses, excuses, excuses for why we have failed in our mission to preach the gospel to all people, we have turned a relationship about Jesus into a religion about Jesus. We have excluded the majority of the world because they don't believe like we do. We've even divided up Christians who have different beliefs than we do. So we are the ones that have messed it up. God's purpose and God's plan, however, will be accomplished and it will be fulfilled with you or without you. And when I see how the institutional church has failed, I don't think God is is so foolish to put all the responsibility for saving the world upon the institutional church. As if that is the last great hope. And, if, and you know, because that's the way it's been preached. If, well, if we don't tell them about Jesus, no one is. Well, the fact is we haven't told them about Jesus. We've told them about church and about religion. We've told them about our ministry. But we haven't even really brought, we haven't even really come to the perfect relationship knowledge of Jesus ourselves, and how in the world can we explain that to anybody else if we're not walking in it? And I'm speaking generally about uh, about religion in general, the Christian religion in particular. He's not holding the world responsible for their failure to believe. He's holding us responsible for our failure to properly introduce the world to him. And so the heart and the purpose of the Lord is to seek and to save that which is lost. Our response to that, see, if we are joining in that pursuit to seek and to save the lost, we're going to rejoice when that happens. And the only ones who aren't rejoicing are the ones so wrapped up in their own salvation that they really don't care. They are the only ones that have an attitude problem here. 
Well, that brings us to the fifth and the last parable, and this is the parable of the lost son. So verse 11 says, A certain man had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. So a prodigal son is not a son who necessarily is lost. A, a prodigal son is a son that is uh, wasting his his money on expensive living. So so get the picture. He goes to his father. He says, I want what's owed to me. I don't want to wait until you die to get my inheritance. That's no fun. I want the inheritance now, and I want to do what I want to do. And guess what? His father said, okay, if that's what you want, here you go. And so he went. In verse 14, when he had spent it, he, when he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in that land and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and he sent him into his fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate and no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger? I will arise and go to my father, and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you, and I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him, and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet. And bring the fatted calf here and kill it, and let us eat and be merry. For this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry." Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I have never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. And we never know from the story whether the son ever, the older son, the angry son, we don't know if he ever went in and joined in the celebration or not. Well, there's different layers of interpretation of this parable. So I'll just go through and make a a couple of points. First of all, we've, we've had three parables here. And, you know, sheep are animals who don't know any better. Coins have no mind of their own. It's because of someone else's carelessness that they are lost. But people are a different story, and people are very difficult because people have a mind of their own. And it's interesting that the father did not refuse the son's request, but he says, okay, if that's what you want, he gave them what he asked for, and he gave him the freedom and the independence that his son wanted. And that's exactly what the father did with Adam. And by extension, that's what he does with each one of us. Because if a person feels like they are forced to do something that they don't really want to do, then there's going to be resentment, and that's not true love. And that's what we see here in the older brother. The older brother stayed home, but had an attitude the whole time. Seething with resentment. And it comes out when? When his father shows compassion on the younger brother. Then all this resentment. He says, lo, these many years I have been serving you. And that's what religion counts. It keeps track of all of that. 
And when you suggest that God intends to save all people, that all men would be saved and come to the full knowledge of the truth, there's this resentment that comes up. And they may not express it openly, but inwardly, there's this thought, well, I've been doing all these things for the Lord. I've been serving the Lord. Oh, I've been going to church all of these years. And you're saying that these people, that they're just going to be saved no matter what they do. So then what's the, and they'll say, they'll use this as an argument. What's the point of me living a holy life? What's the point of me trying to obey God? If people are going to be saved, whether they obey God or not. That's their rationale. That's how they look at it. It's no different than the older son in the parable. Now, in this case, the son is lost due to his own self-centered rebellion. He chose independence from his father. And that is the heart of the sheep analogy. When Isaiah says that all of us like sheep have gone astray, each one of us have turned aside to our own way, and that's the picture of mankind, each one of us. So it's not just Adam. We talk about Adam and, and how that set a chain of events in action, but Isaiah says every one of us, all of us are like sheep that have gone astray, and each one, everyone, you and me and everyone on the face of this earth, all of us, have at one point been in rebellion against the Lord. All of us, like sheep, have gone astray. Now, you might be like the elder brother that says, Oh, I've kept your commandments all these years. I've, I've worked for you, and I've labored for you, and I've, I've been a, a good Christian and a good believer. But he is just as far away from his father as that younger son was there in the pigsty. He may be there physically, but spiritually and in his heart, he, is, he has no concept of the goodness and greatness of his father. He's complaining about what he doesn't have. And his father says, you are, you, you are always with me and all that I have is yours. <laughs> I mean, I, I read that and I want to say, you idiot. You're right there in the father's house. Everything that he has is yours and you're complaining about what you don't have. Whose fault is that? It's your fault, dumb dumb. All these years you've been with the Father and you didn't even understand his heart, you didn't even know who he was, who he who he is. All that he has is yours. And you're walking around in a dark cloud. So we think that the son is lost, but who's really lost here? We think the younger brother is lost because he went out and, and committed all of these sins, and he was, but I would say to you that the older brother is just as lost as the younger brother. So as I say, this represents all the children of Adam, each one of us who have turned aside to our own way and we left the father's house. Adam did it, and each one of us has done it. And it's only by the grace of God that one day we wake up and realize we're living in a pig pen. And there's this desire to return to the Father. And where, where does that desire come from? It comes from the Father. So the son came to himself. And I, I, like, the, I like the way that is worded. It's like he, he woke up one day and, and came to a realization. And he repented, which means he changed his mind. He changed his heart. He changed his behavior. He changed his direction. He said, I would rather be a servant in my father's house than be king of the pig pen. And he decided to return home. He had his independence. He did everything that he wanted, and he realized it was nothing but pig slop. Now, different people in their life are at different levels of realization of this. Some people are living in the pig pen, but they have not They have not come to themselves yet. They haven't woken up yet. They don't realize that they're living in squalor. They don't realize that they're living in pig filth. And some haven't even got to that point yet, but I'm telling you this is the path, the independent path away from the Father. This is what it leads to. It leads to the enjoyment of sin for a season, but then comes the fall, then comes the crash, then comes the pig pen.
And then hopefully and eventually, and by the grace of God, our eyes are opened and we see what we have done and we realize, I've got to go back. I've sinned against heaven and against God. I'm no longer worthy to be called a son, but I'm going back to my father's house. So there has to be that repentance because it has to be voluntary. It has to be willingly. And that's why I don't accept the common interpretation that every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that God is somehow forcing everyone to confess against their will. Even while they're burning in hell, they're confessing that Jesus is Lord. The father let his son go. And when his son was ready, he returned and came back. No one twisted his arm, but the weight of his own sin, the weight of his own circumstances, the weight of his own rebellion got to him. And he woke up, came to himself, went back to his father. God doesn't have to force anyone to do that. And if they feel like they are forced or they feel like that he that they are being compelled to do something against their will, then it's not love. But I guarantee you one thing, when this son goes back, he's not leaving again. <laughs> but it does make you wonder about the older son. So the older son, as I say, he reveals his self-righteousness. He reveals the religious spirit that many people have who rejoice in their own salvation and think that everyone else thinks that they are more righteous than the others and that they are more worthy of the Father's blessings. And instead of rejoicing, see in all three of these parables, in in the first parable when the sheep comes home, they have a celebration. In the second parable, the parable of the coin, they have a celebration. Here they're having a celebration, but now he's focusing in on these scribes and Pharisees that are complaining about sinners entering into the kingdom of God. Well, in that attitude, our self-righteousness and our religious spirit is revealed, if that is our attitude. So again, I'm asking you in this parable, uh, which son is really lost? Who is really lost here? Well, the younger son was considered lost, and he found his way home again. But then the son that never left home, I would say to you spiritually, he's, he's as lost as the younger son ever was. So this parable also applies to Israel. Israel is the older son who complained that they had served God and kept all of God's commandments, and yet all of these sinners and all of, the, all of these Gentiles who don't know the law, these sinners who don't know God, yet they're all coming and sitting down to eat and drink in the kingdom of God, and those to whom the kingdom should have been prepared for, they find themselves on the outside. So four lessons as we close up. Four lessons of the lost and found. Number one, all of us are lost. All of us are perishing in our own way and cannot seek God and cannot save ourselves. I mean, that's your condition before you're saved. All of us are lost and perishing when we are in our own way. And when you are lost, you can't seek God and you can't save yourself. No more than a blind man can decide to start seeing or a dead man can can just decide to start living. Something has to happen. The eyes have to be opened. The dead have to be raised from the dead, and only Jesus can do that. But this is the natural condition of the children of Adam, and it's your natural condition apart from the Lord Jesus. Romans 3.10 Verses uh, 10, 11, and 12 says that all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. There is none that is righteous, no, not one. Isaiah 53, 6 is that verse I've referenced where it says that all of us, 
like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us have turned aside to our own way. So it's not just something that Adam did that affects me. It's something that we do all the time. Even those who say that they are following the Lord, often they follow their own will, their own plan, their own life. They turn aside and go their own way, and they expect God to bless it. But the point is, this is the natural condition of all of us when we are born into this world. All of us are born like the younger son, that we want to be independent, we want to be free, and we think that being we think that freedom is independence from having to do what God wants. We want to do our will, not his will. And that's why discipleship is the reverse of that. Not my will, but your will be done. Well, we can't naturally save ourselves. We can't even seek God. It says no one seeks after God. And John six forty four, it says that no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. You can't come to Jesus on your own. <laughs> So that puts the responsibility for saving, for seeking and saving, it puts it upon the Lord. He knows where we are. He knows what it will take. And we can't save ourselves. We can't even seek God for ourselves. But if we are seeking the Lord at all, it's because he's drawing us to him. And if we're seeking him, it's because the Holy Spirit leads us and guides us into all truth. But he even told his disciples, you did not choose me, but I chose you. And as he told Israel, I didn't choose you because you were the best, but because you were the, the least. I didn't choose you because you were more righteous than the rest, because you are stiff-necked and rebellious generation yourself. But he blesses us and he shows his grace and his love and his compassion towards us so that we can be some kind of an example to other people of the grace and goodness and mercy and forgiveness and love of God. So the second lesson we learn from the parables of lost and found is that God loves the lost as much as he loves the found. He doesn't love you any more than he loves anyone else. We tend to love people who love us and we tend to like people who think the way we do and believe the way we do. But in God's eyes, every person is valuable. God loves the sinner as much as he loves the saint. The worst mass murderer who ever lived is just as worthy of God's love as the greatest so-called saint who ever lived. God loves the lost as much as he loves the found, and that's illustrated in these parables where he goes after everybody. If they're lost, he goes after them. He seeks them and he searches for them until he finds them and brings them home. It shows that God loves the lost as much as he loves the found, and it shows that every person is valuable in his eyes because God is no respecter of persons over and over again. Acts 10.34, Romans 2.11, James 2.1, and others say that God is no respecter of persons. He doesn't consider one person to be more worthy. He doesn't consider white to be more worthy than black. He doesn't consider male to be more worthy than female. He doesn't consider Indian to be more worthy than Englishman or vice versa. And all the different um, um, sociological strata and gender diversity and nationality and Jew or Gentile, male or female, circumcised or uncircumcised, God is no respecter of persons. Acts 10.34, Peter says, I, I realize now, he realized when the Holy Spirit was poured out upon people who were not Jewish. That was like a huge, huge thing. And Peter says, I, I perceive, it's like a light bulb goes off in Peter. He says, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Same Holy Spirit that he poured out on the Jews, he's poured out on Gentiles because it's all by his grace. Oh, grace for everybody? Oh, yeah. Gospel of Jesus for everybody? Yeah. Not just for the Jews, but for everybody? Yeah. That's it. Because God loves the lost as much as he loves the found. Every person is valuable. He doesn't just love you when you love him. And that love never fails. 
And that's why the third lesson, the Son of Man has come both to seek and to save the lost. Love never fails. But I tell you what, love isn't just going to sit back and wait to see if anybody's going to believe or not. Jesus does what we cannot do. Jesus does what we are not willing to do. He goes places we're not willing to go. He says things we're not willing to say. He knows things we don't know. He sees things we don't see. He hears things we don't hear. And he isn't just saving the lost, honey. He is seeking and searching and finding and rescuing and delivering the lost. And thank God that he is. Thank God that he is the Savior of all men, especially those who believe. But thank God that it it is not all up to me and to you and to the failed institutional church to seek and to save the lost. They don't seek and save the lost anyway. They put out advertisements that say, come to church, come to church. They want people to come to them, come to them, come to us. The harvest has to harvest itself. Harvest, the blind man has to be able to see how to get to church. The deaf man has to be able to hear how to get to church. The dead man has to come up out of the grave and go to a place to experience the gospel because we don't seek and save the lost. We expect them to come looking for us. I'm just saying the traditional religious approach is a failure. And we saw that in the parable of the Good Samaritan. Religion sees that half-dead man in the middle of the road, passes him by, and goes on the other way. Because they're not trying to get people saved. They're just trying to get people to give and to support and to attend. Well, the Son of Man has come both to seek and to save the lost. Now, it would be great if he just saved the lost. But then that sets us up for this whole religious condition. Well, in order for Jesus to save you, here's what you have to do. A, B, C, 1, 2, 3, and especially you have to go to church in order for all of this to happen. Because Jesus can't save you in the Walmart. Jesus can't save you in in a bar. Jesus can't save you in the club. Jesus can't save you at home. You have to go to church for Jesus to save you. So we can set all of these conditions on what it takes for Jesus to save you. But what I love about this is the seeking. He is seeking and saving. He invites people to come, but he's not going to sit back and wait. He's going to seek and save, seek and save, search and rescue. He looks until he finds and brings them home again. That's what I love about the Savior. And the fourth lesson, and this is what is so, for, I, I really, I can't understand why it is so difficult for people. Mentally, yeah, I guess it's hard to wrap your mind about, around something, but can't you at least wrap your heart around the idea that God will save them all? If he's willing to save them all and he's able to save them all, why would he not save them all? Jesus will not stop seeking and saving until the last sheep is found and returned home. 1 Peter 2, 4 says that God wants us to pray for all men, it starts out, because God's desire, his will, his heart, is that all men would be saved and would come to the full knowledge of the truth. 2 Peter 3, 9 says that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And there's many more scriptures that I could give to support the idea, at least, that God wants to save them all. And I think there's plenty more to support the idea that when God expresses his will, he's not just expressing his preference or a wish, like we would say, I wish I I wish I had a million dollars. It may or may not come true, probably won't come true. But when God expresses his will and his desire, it says that no man can thwart his purpose. He does according to his will in heaven and earth. And that's what makes him such a wonderful savior. John ten sixteen, Jesus says, Other sheep I have which are not of this fold, them also I must bring, and they will hear my voice, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. He's saying right there, I'm not just interested in saving the Jews, I'm interested in saving everybody. And then John twelve thirty two says, If I am lifted up above the earth, I will draw all men unto myself. And that word draw there, we said in the Greek, is drag, and it's the same 
word that they use to draw a fish out of the ocean. The fish don't decide that they want to be caught that day, but the fisherman throws the net out and then he draws it to shore. He drags it to shore and there's the fish. And Jesus says, I'll teach you to be fishers of men. He says, if I'm lifted up, I will draw or drag all people to me. (laughs) And it's the same word that says that no one can come to me unless the father draws or drags him. It's the same word. So I just find that, uh, I just find that very, very uh, encouraging. And I rejoice in that. I rejoice in the greatness and goodness of God's plan. And people who get bent out of shape over the suggestion, uh, they call it a heresy. I call it uh, a great hope. I I think it's the greatest news, the greatest hope of all. Because it glorifies Jesus. Don't label me. Don't attach an ism to me. I'm just talking about Jesus and the greatness and the goodness of the shepherd to seek and to save until that last sheep is found and is returned home with man it is impossible but with god all things are possible and he is able if he's willing and if he's able i just i'm dumb enough just to believe that he's going to do it okay so many times you know the parables of jesus are meant to correct a wrong impression (laughs) right? So the parables of the lost and found are very important because they teach us that God's will is for Christ to seek and to save the lost. That is his will. That's his purpose. God did not favor Israel in order to damn the rest of the world, but to bless the rest of the world. Likewise, God does not favor believers in order to send unbelievers to hell, but to shine the light and love of God into their darkness so they can be saved. God's purpose is good, and his will is that none perish, but that all would be saved and come to the full knowledge of the truth. The confidence we have is that as Christ is lifted up, he will draw all people to himself, gather all the lost sheep, and bring all the prodigal sons of Adam back into his father's house. If you'd like to get additional teachings, audio recordings, books, and other Christ-centered resources to help you grow spiritually, visit us online at chiprogden.com.